everyone, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Show, where we talk about health tips and strategies to help you be smart, sexy, and strong. Most of us have some unhealthy habits we resort to when life gets stressful and we need a little relief. Some people take these vices to the extreme and become addicted. Whether it's food, drugs, sex, alcohol, gambling, shopping, or some other activity or substance, addictions cause a great deal of suffering. My guest today, Roy Nelson, was morbidly obese and an addict. And for years, he feared he was hopeless. But after overcoming all his addictions by healing the underlying causes, he has dedicated his life in the past 25 years to helping others achieve the same freedom. On today's show, we talk about when vices become addictions, what causes people to cross that line, and Roy also shares his journey and how he helps other people with addictions. So enjoy the show. Today, I'm interviewing Roy Nelson. Welcome, Roy. It's great to have you. I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Great. So, you know, you've got a really interesting journey, a really interesting story. And so tell us um, about, about your journey, about what it's been like as an addiction survivor. Well, I guess the easiest way to put it, I almost died at birth, and I kind of went downhill from there. Uh, it's uh, Actually, I grew up in a very violent, poverty-stricken family home, and uh, really tough people and tough neighborhood, tough town, tough school, tough all over the place. And everybody was tough but me. <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was not easy growing up. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, I... As it turns out, I, I, you know, I didn't think I'd ever drink after all I'd experienced as a result of people drinking until I drank. And I realized what a drink could do for a person like me, a person that was shy and afraid and self-centered and all that. <clears throat> and, of course, I always used food from the very beginning. And, of course, the, the sex obsession was there long before I even knew what sex was. Anything to get relief, anything that would give you relief. And fantasy, of course, was the first addiction, as it is with most addicts. You know, when the, when the here and now is too painful, we go to there and then. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, it's, it's a progressive condition. It, you know, and, and as it turns out, I, I started smoking cigarettes. I worked from the time I was a little kid. I made my own money and, and you know, bought my things and stuff. And, and uh, so, yeah, uh, Basically, I left home when I was 14, and, um, and uh, you know, always working, and, and always working with older people, naturally, when you're, when you're a kid and everybody else is an adult. So it just uh, didn't, nothing seemed really out of the ordinary. I joined the Army the day I was 17, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, it just, nothing was out of the ordinary because, the, and I made rank pretty fast in the Army, so in a very short period of time, my peers, rank-wise, were a whole lot older than me. And so I just, the way I drink, drank didn't seem out of the ordinary. The way I smoked didn't seem out of the ordinary. The way I ate didn't seem out of the ordinary. You know, everybody was obsessed with sex. I mean, it just, like it was no, you know, and I did a good job and got the job done. So it didn't, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. But I started to, I was always afraid. No matter what, no matter how many tough guy things I did, I was still afraid, and uh, I started having panic attacks. Actually, when I when I was about 28 years old, I, I started having trouble with claustrophobia on airplanes, and I started going to doctors and therapists and one thing and another, and of course there, there's no solution for people like me. It's because I suffer from a condition that requires a spiritual solution. And but you have to play out, you know, I would have done anything to keep them having to go on a spiritual basis, given the crazy religious experiences as a child that I had. And, you know, and so basically I had to do everything I could do, intellectual or medical approach or psychological approach before I could come to a place where I was either going to have to go on a spiritual basis or I wasn't going to make it. And so that's how it began. And, you know, of course, I at the time. You know, that was, I thought my life was over, but I didn't realize that my life was just beginning. So that's that's how it kind of unfolded for me. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I basically for a number of, for quite some time, I looked for people who could help me. And I found some. A lot of people helped me a little bit and few people helped me a lot. But I could never find any place or anyone that had all I needed. And so what I had to do is I had to gather pieces from a lot of different people and a lot of different, you know, teachings and a lot of lots. You know, I was very open to learning. And uh, I started to incorporate things that I'd learned and and um, use which that which worked and discard that which didn't work. And then I realized, ultimately realized that you don't need to go looking for the truth. What you have to look for is the untruth and the, un, the myth, the, you know, the faulty belief system, the faulty data, the faulty philosophy has had to be unlearned. And my experience is when you, un, you unlearn those things, the truth is right there in your face. So <clears throat> that's been my journey. So I'm, a, I'm an eager student to unlearn. <laughs> I knew everything, but I was dying. You know, I knew all about everything. No question, no topic you could bring up that I didn't know all about it. But uh, you know, there I was. There I was. So anyway, here I am, and I so I ultimately started helping other people, and never realizing I really had anything to offer other than that I knew I had to try to be helpful to people. And so, in the beginning, I just did what I could do. Um. You know, I might pick up a hitchhiker and give him a, take him where he needed to go, give him five bucks or help somebody with their bags or whatever. I didn't realize that I had anything of a real spiritual nature to offer until uh, I started doing that and people started getting results. And then I started to realize that there was something, this spiritual power working through me somehow that helped other people heal. And so that's been my life for the last 30 years is helping, trying to help other people who can't get the, what they need by any other means. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of how you've helped people spiritually? Well, a lot of people who come, and certainly it's not a prerequisite, but a lot of people who come to me are suffering from addictions or eating disorders or obesity or panic attacks or phobias or whatever. It really doesn't matter what a person perceives their problem to be because all the problems that we think we have are all symptoms. There's only one real problem that a human being can have and that is the perception of being separate from that sweet spirit within. You can't be separate from it, but you can perceive yourself to be separate. And that's what causes us to look for something outside of ourselves to try to fill up that void that we find deep within. So, you know, from uh, all kinds of things. Uh, well, Trisha is an example. You know, Trisha, she came to me about 20, coming up on 27 years ago for some disorder. And she had tried everything she knew how to do and to get better. And uh, she couldn't find the help she needed. And so she came to me. She knew some people I was working with at the time. And she had actually heard me speak. And so one thing and another, yeah, she came to get some help. And then she realized what was happening here and she wanted to be a part of it. So she decided to, to adopt me and join me. And uh, so we've been traveling this road together for all these years and uh, we, you know, being able to be helpful to whoever we can. <clears throat> Lots of examples. One fellow was taking about two, between 50 and 200 Vicodin every day, plus um, three packs of cigarettes and, all kinds of alcohol and antidepressants, any drugs he could get anywhere. He used to have to have a 12-pack of Coca-Cola every day to kill the dry mouth he got from the Vicodin. And uh, his wife actually heard Trisha on a radio program one morning, and uh, he contacted me, and within 48 hours, he was off of everything. And he said he never even had any withdrawal feelings from it. And uh, he's been clean now for 14 years off of all of it. So lots of examples, uh, bulimics and, you know, a lot of bulimics, a lot of anorexic and a lot of, you know, it's, it's all the same illness. There's no, it, it manifests itself in many, many different ways, whether it's alcohol or drugs or sex addiction or, you know, there's a lot of very socially accepted addiction, you know, like a lot of people 
you know, overwork as a, as a way to cope with their lives. You know, a lot of people, you do all kinds of exercise and different things, that, you know, to try to cope uh, with their lives. But it, it really doesn't matter. And none of us, we're not here to indict anybody for what they're doing. Everybody's doing the best they can. It's just that um, it's not a problem until it's a problem. You know, and we're not here to, we're, at, we're in competition with no one. If they can get the help they need by any other means, we suggest they do so. And um, and if they don't think they need help, then that's good too. But the nice thing is with, you know, the approach that we take is, you know, if somebody's hearing this or seeing this and and they, they know someone who may have a problem, you don't have to go confront them and grab them by the, by the shirt and say, hey, you got a fat, you're fat or you're a, you're a drunk or you're whatever you are. They can just say, we, you know, I, I heard about this guy who's had a lot of these different problems and has been been able to overcome them and he's devoted his life to helping other people would be happy to speak with you. So it's not, it's nothing, nothing threatening about it. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's great because, you know, I think that they're, tip, yeah. they're also, they're the typical addictions that we think of with alcohol right. and drugs. And then there are some of the other ones that you, you mentioned, but, but there are a lot of addictions out there. A lot of people no that doubt. sometimes people aren't even aware of that, what they have as an addiction. Absolutely. Well, the other thing is those ad addicts don't want to hear about being a being addicts. You know, they know. I mean, I I really didn't relate to being uh, uh, an overeater, even though I was two hundred and seventy five pounds. To me, it just it was normal. It was you know, and I didn't relate to being an alcoholic because to me, I mean, I had I had anxiety and I had panic attacks and things like that. And I used alcohol to treat those, but I just liked alcohol better than I liked the pills the doctors prescribed. You know, so to me, it didn't seem, you know, I didn't think I had a problem with alcohol. And frankly, none of these things are the problem. These are things we use to try to cope with the problem. The problem is the discomfort, the dis-ease that resides deep within our, in our subconscious mind, actually. And certainly there are physical aspects of it, the allergies you know, of the body and that type of thing. But it's really, it's really a soul sickness. That's what it really is, hmm. and it, and that's the only place it can be treated. Okay. In in, re, in reality, certainly there's detoxes and places people go and treatment centers and things like that. But unfortunately, most people relapse because they don't really ever get around to seeing what the real problem is, or getting to the real solution. Mm hmm. So what are some things that people can start doing to, to, well, to start their journey of healing? What are some first steps that people can take? Maybe they're just starting to realize, hey, maybe I have a problem or should I? I know I have someone I love that might have a problem. What are, what are some things that people can do in those beginning stages? Well, there's a lot of things people can do. You know, just first off, we had to start taking care of ourselves, you know, and we, taking, taking the time to to get the rest we need. Taking, learning how to meditate would be a wonderful thing. In fact, I, I've been teaching people how to meditate for many, many years. That's uh, something that could help people to, to slow down. We're looking, we need to slow down, you know, and, and uh, you know, sitting down for, for your meals, three meals a day, you know. I mean, it's, there's a lot of things of, in, in the way of self-care that, gives us helps us to understand that we we deserve better than we're giving ourselves a lot of things people can do mm -hmm. so tell us about the the nelson method um how does the, your 28 days to freedom compare to other methods like the 12-step program that a lot of people are familiar with and traditional treatment centers how is it different well it's considerably different uh in the sense that uh, first off if a person can get the help they need through a treatment center or a 12-step program, then that would be a fine thing to do, you know, if they can. So we're not in competition with any of those, those people. Um, but what, what I'm about is helping people feel safe enough because I've been to the depths of hell and I have recovered. I'm about helping people feel safe enough to be able to start to, start to see things about themselves, about their lives, and about the people and the circumstances in their lives that they are otherwise not able to see because of fear, pride, willfulness, lots of things. 
And so it's a, it's a very simple process. I do a 28-day one-on-one face-to-face program, but they don't have to be locked up because within the first day or so, the addiction is going to fall away. The, the whatever the whatever they're suffering from, as far as whatever they're destroying themselves with, is going to fall away because they're going to lose interest in it because they're going to be they're going to feel safe enough to start facing the real problem. And so, um, yeah, I meet with people for a couple of hours and each day, and then maybe a couple more hours in the evening, something like that, so that you know, and then uh, teach just teach a lot of uh, new new uh, concepts and new ideas. And then once they realize that the problem is much deeper than the addiction, see, most all the other places anybody would go, they're treating the symptom as if it were the problem. The idea that overeating is the problem and not overeating is the solution. Well, that would be fine. Only the problem is, is people can't stay stopped. You know, the same with is the alcohol. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, has been the most successful treatment for helping alcoholics stop drinking in the history of the world. Yet very small percentage of people actually get sober and stay sober. And if they do, they often die of other addictions. The founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, in fact, both founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, one died from, one had to have meatloaf every day, you know what I mean? And the other one, which, God bless him, they didn't know what, how many chemicals were in in our food at that time. And another one had to smoke cigarettes. He, he, he couldn't stop smoking cigarettes and that doesn't make them bad guys. Thank God they did what they did. If they didn't do what they did then we wouldn't be doing what we're doing now. So, you know, I'm not in any way criticizing any or judging anyone like that. I'm just saying my dear sister, Patty was the matriarch of the North Sacramento group of alcoholics. Anonymous. She had been sober for 35 years she had, but she never got, you know, she died from lung cancer because she couldn't stop smoking cigarettes and she'd been married four times, never got on her feet financially. You know what I mean? And I'm not cu- in any way criticizing her. It's just that if we don't have that shift in consciousness, if we don't, if we don't feel better about ourselves, then it's really a matter of we're going to have to destroy ourselves one way or another. Mm-hmm. See, as long as I had the pain I was going to crave the painkillers. Now, there are lots of painkillers, you know, sex, food, alcohol, drugs, whatever. There's lots and lots of painkillers. You know, getting approval is, is a big painkiller. Uh, as long as I had the pain, I was going to have to have the painkiller. As long as I had the fear, I was going to, I was going to constantly be looking to, for a way of escaping. I had to escape. I had to escape. And as long as I had the guilt... I was going to, and the shame, I was going to require punishment. And so that's the nature of the condition. And every addiction has those three components. It's a painkiller, it's a form of escape, and it's a form of punishment. Mm-hmm. And so the only hope, really, of not, of not destroying ourselves is, is, to, is to come to believe that we deserve a better way of living. We des- and what I teach is a, literally a way of living that will lead us to a new way of thinking, which will lead us to a, a whole new world, transformed by the renewing of our mind. Wow. You know, it's, it's such a, for many people, that's a hard concept to grasp. It's a, it's a hard shift to make. And, and like you're saying, it's a lot easier to go, like I know my grandmother used to smoke cigarettes, and she... She stopped smoking, then she was drinking Coca-Cola all day long. She'd always have a glass of Coca-Cola in her hand. And so I feel like a lot of times with addictions, people just trade one for the other. One that made me more socially acceptable. Another thing that she had was shopping. She would shop all the time. So, you know, and we know know that this is a pattern for people. And what you're talking about is so different from what a lot of people think of when when we talk about addictions. Well, I was blessed to have so many addictions that there's no way on earth. It's like me trying to hold a dozen beach balls underwater. There's no way on earth I could get all of them underwater at the same time. So I had to go below the addiction to be healed. I had to go below to the, actually below the, the addicted personality and to the spirit, sweet spirit deep within. It's the only thing that can heal us. 
It's not some bearded man in the sky with a clipboard and a pitchfork or whatever. I mean, it's deep within. That's where I had to go. And uh, that's a scary journey for people who are terrified of themselves and terrified of God. You know, I mean, that's the nature of the illness, too, is that it's all about fear, fear of God, fear of ourselves, fear of being out of control, all these various fears. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm about is helping people realize that they can be free and to help them be free. And it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing experience to see. I mean, I was in awe. I had no idea that I could be free. I, I, I had, when I had that first experience, I had no, I was, I was, it was in complete awe. I had no, how on earth could it be that simple? Yeah. You know, you know, it, I think it's interesting that you say that you were blessed with having so many addictions. That's yeah. not something that, that people recognize, but now looking back, you can see, I guess that that helped you recover that if you had just kept in that mindset and you hadn't shifted that it would have, it would have kept you on a, a really uh, destructive path. Yeah. Well, I've suffered from dep depression and anxiety as well as, you know, addictions and all kinds of, you know, I was morbidly obese. I was, you know, just completely, you know, completely hopeless in and of myself. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there might be people wondering if they're the right fit for, for the Nelson method. How, how will people know if it's something that they can heal on their own and if they should go to, you know, to your method or something different? Well, you know, it, if a person is hurting, uh, you know, one thing they could do is, is go to our website and take a look and see if they identify. There's got a, a few w a videos on there of people who have gotten the help. The other thing is uh, reading the book, you know, my new book, how they might benefit from, you know, from that. And, uh, you know, if, if they identify, if they think they identify, contact us. It, it doesn't cost anything to contact us, and we're happy to hear from you. And we have a lot in common, whether you get help from us or or somebody else, you, you, we have a lot in common, so we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> so, if people um, do your method, what um, what are they? What kinds of things that they expect to experience and learn through that process? You have well, five, five pillars of transformation. Is that correct? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, the, to begin with, it's really about awakening to the realize that the problem, the real problem, is deep within. It's not. It's not drinking or, or drugs or alcohol. And, and even people who suffer from addictions, as you mentioned, your grandmother, but, you know, it's never just one addiction anyway. And, and, and you don't even have to have an addiction because everybody's, everybody's got problems. So it doesn't matter if a person even has an addiction or if you, and a lot of people don't think they do till they get here and they start realizing they start getting able to, to feel safe enough to start, start seeing some things. So it doesn't matter if you're, if you're in pain and you've, you've been here and you've been there, you know, if you can't, there's not a whole lot of options. There's, there's therapy, right? There's psych, you know, psychological, there's therapy of sort. There's 12 step programs. There's, you know, treatment centers and various and sundry things like that. But there's not a whole lot of, you know, I mean, we get people who have been in a lot of treatment centers and they still couldn't get the, the help they need. They've been in 12 step programs for years and years and couldn't get the help they need. So it really, you know, it doesn't matter, but first off, we start to re have to realize that the real problem is, is a lot deeper than we think it is. And uh, the, once the person comes and they, they start connecting with me and we, uh, you know, we spend some time together here and they start to relax, then we start to realize that at that time we start doing what we call discovery work. You know, in a law, in a situation where you're considering a lawsuit, you do discovery to see if you got a big enough case to go forward. Well, what I do is I do have people do a discovery work to see if they have a big enough case where they need a spiritual solution. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, because I would have done, personally would have done anything to keep from having to go on a spiritual basis because I had so many preconceived ideas about what that would entail. And so I... You know, and then once they once we realize that they do need a spiritual solution, then we basically we come to that place where where we we go we embrace that 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 you know we start to embrace that solution, and then when we start doing the excavation work, 
And what we're literally doing is excavating all the old faulty data, all the old faulty beliefs, all the old faulty philosophy. We're excavating the master computer. We, what do you call it? Defragging the master computer. So we're unlearning, 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 letting go of the, the ideas that didn't pay off for us and then starting to let the sweet spirit within start to well up in us to cast out that fear, to cast out all that old stuff that, that's hurting us, the pain. And then it's at that point, then we're ready to start to grasp the expansive living that we're talking about and start, you know, we're, we're actually learning this new way of living, which is it's literally an, an, an opportunity. It's a, a limitless opportunity. In my experience, there's no, there's no limit to how far down this condition can take us when we're down that downward spiral. But what's also true is there's no limit to how high we can go with sweet spirit holding us up. Yeah, it's amazing how we get bogged down with misbeliefs, misunderstandings, judgments of ourselves yeah. and others, and how so these true. really hold us back and, and sure. create a lot of pain and suffering. And having tools to let go of those can be really beneficial. And so I think that's great that you're helping people with that, with that of letting go of those things and instead of carrying them around like, like a big burden on our back or, yeah. you know, weighing us down. So to yeah. let go of those and then realizing that we're not alone in the world, that we, we can be yeah. connected with spirit and have that, that guidance and, and knowledge from within. I, I love that. That's, that's really yeah. nice. That's great that you're doing that work. So let's talk a bit about your book. You, um, what inspired you to write your book, Love Notes from Hell? Well, actually, people had been telling me for about three decades that I should write a book, but I didn't know it was going to happen, how it was going to happen. And uh, we had hired ghost writers and one thing and another to, you know, to try to get the book put together. I'm, you know, really, uh, but ultimately, we, we hired this branding lady who demanded a book. And uh, so then we started, she hired a ghost writer, but the ghost writer couldn't get it to Trisha's satisfaction. So Trisha decided she was going to write it herself. So she wrote the book in 30 days, and then we spent 30 days editing it, and that's how the book came about. Ah, wow. Okay, so, great. Yeah. All right. So in addition to some of the things that we talked about, you also work with uh, a lot of women with um, mm -hmm. food and weight issues. True. Um, um, and so some of these things might relate to their sexuality, or what are some of the things that – that you find with these issue, with these um, concerns that they have, it's it's always related to it's that's that I call it religious insanity manifested as sexual insanity. Uh. The pri the primary thing that we get the, we, there's a lot of things we get from religion, but the primary thing we get is that our sexuality is bad. And then of course <clears throat> we go one or the other one way or another. Um, sometimes we use alcohol and drugs to facilitate to fire the you know to basically we, we either either go completely promiscuous or we go asexual and bury it with food and sometimes we vacillate back and forth sometimes it's alcohol and drugs sex love and rock and roll till we do that we can't do it anymore and then we go to the other extreme and get married perhaps and start putting on weight or it could be the other way around you know but invariably the young women think it's they're going to be happy when they get him. And the older ladies think they're going to be happy when they get rid of him. You know, <laughs> either way, but Billy Joel says that either way you wake up with yourself, you know, and that's the one you got to make peace with. <laughs> it's, it's so true. It's, it's definitely yeah. true. And, and yeah. people definitely will use um, food and weight gain as a way to kind of protect themselves, make themselves Absolutely. numb or, you know, I guess with Absolutely. weight gain, maybe it's because they feel like, you know, if they put that extra weight on, they kind of have this barrier, mm -hmm. this protect, and or they won't be looked at as attractive anymore. And there's so many different possibilities with that that are just built up with misbeliefs and misunderstandings, right? Yeah. It's unbelievable, though, that when they're in the anorexic and bulimic state, they'll kill themselves to keep, to stay thin so they, stay, so they can stay attractive. Until the fact that usually, I mean, it starts off with anorexia lots of times, 
somebody said they were they were pudgy or something, and they said they start starving themselves, then they lose control of that. Eventually, if they don't. If they some people, a lot of people die from it, but those who can't die from it because they lose control of the anorexia, then they become often become bulimic, which is another way of trying to cope with overeating, and then ultimately. And because they're that serious about wanting to be thin, so they'll be attractive. And on the on, then beyond that, they lose control of that, and they, of course they put on 50 pounds or whatever, and, they, and then they say they've, they've actually overcome an eating disorder. But they haven't overcome the eating disorder. They've just switched it to obesity versus, versus anorexia or bulimia. It's all the same condition. But, yeah, it's, it's all connected, you know, all connected, believing that we're not good, that our sexuality is bad, that, you know, that we're bad because we have sexual feelings. And, and of course, sensitive people like us have more feelings. Oftentimes, we're more conscious of, of feelings, and they're, and they're scary for, for those of us who are afraid, thinking we're bad. So, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an insidious condition. However, once, uh, you know, because of because I've been there and I've worked with many 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 women who who've had these various problems, it may be a mystery to them why they're destroying themselves, but it's not a mystery to me. And so, in other words, it it's not it's not hard to. It may seem insurmountable when you're trying to do it on your own or when you're trying to do it at some place where they don't. You know, it's it's easy to get help from people who can't help you. It's easy to ask for help. You know, for people from people who can't help you, but once my experience is if, if once they if if they're really if they're willing see this is not really about getting good, it's about getting real. It's like the Velveteen Rabbit. He had it figured out already. He he, he knew it was about getting real. And that's what I'm about is getting real. So having people get real. You you were already good. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So with um with addictions, uh, I know with alcohol, uh, people are addicted to alcohol. They really have to give up alcohol entirely. Um, but they're like we talked about. There are a lot of other addictions like overworking, uh, ch- shopping, shopaholics, yeah, um, absolutely, sex addictions, mm-hmm. food addictions, all of these things. Now, but we can't give up all of these things. Right. Right. So well, we don't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, you wouldn't recommend that someone who has. I mean, maybe you would. Maybe someone with a sex addiction. Would you tell them they shouldn't have sex? Well, here's the important thing: is that we don't even tell alcoholics not to drink. What happens here is they lose interest in it. See, in other words, they completely lose interest in anything that isn't good for them. So, in in, in the case of an alcoholic with alcohol, they don't they don't drink because they don't want to drink. Or they don't use drugs because they don't want to use drugs. And with the sex and food, you know, we have to eat. And, you know, I mean, I enjoy my food more than I did when I was morbidly obese. And, uh, you know, the nice thing about this, you, you know, you just, Trisha asked me 27 years ago, she said, does that mean you're, that mean you're celibate? And I said, no, it means I'm selective. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you get, you get a choice. What we're talking about is giving people a choice. You don't have to go to bed with somebody just because they want you to or just because, you know, you're afraid they won't like you if you don't or whatever the case it may be. That's afraid, a, you won't, afraid you won't get something you need if you don't or whatever it is. Yeah, so. that's such a, it's such an encouraging thing to think about because I think yeah. when people are addicted, they think, I can't live without that. Yeah, to, right. to be able to get to the place where they... I mean, p- probably people can't even fathom what that would be like, but to be able right. to get to the place where... I, I don't want to drink. I, right. did, yeah. you know, don't don't need to overwork. Uh, right. I don't need these things to be able to get to that place. is a very powerful place to be. Yeah, it's it's all grace, but it is a wonderful place to be for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's I'm I'm so excited about um, that you're sharing this with us today, and and that's great that they people have you as a resource, and that there are options out there for people. So how do people how do people find you and learn more about you? Well, they can go on the web to RoyNelsonHealing.com. It's uh, and uh, they could also on there. There's a 
on the website there's a an addictive personality quiz which might be interesting for someone to take mm-hmm. and that's uh, Roy Nelson healing.com backslash quiz and of course they can also go to on on my website and order my book it'll take you to Amazon you can order my book love notes from hell and uh, that could be interesting and we'd love to hear from y'all otherwise you can dial 800-609-4061 800-609-4061. Great. Day or night. All right. Wow, that's great. And and I'll oh. also put those links up on my website so so people can have those. And any um any last parting thoughts on where people can start to building their self confidence so that they can make healthier choices? The most important thing I could say to anyone who has this condition and thinks they're so bad. So two things I say: you ain't that good at being bad, and it's okay if you have trouble with God because God doesn't have any trouble with you. <laughs> okay, great. All right, thank you so much for your interview today, Roy. Really appreciate all your information. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Roy Nelson. To get the links to the quiz and the book he mentioned or learn more about Roy, you can visit my website, drtrevorcates.com. Go to the podcast page with his interview and you'll see all the links there. If you like this interview or have other ideas for interviews, please send me a Facebook message at Dr. Trevor Cates. And I would love to hear your feedback. And also, don't forget to go to iTunes and subscribe to the Spot Doctor podcast so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. Thank you and have a great day.